as uh, out of touch and, and uh, out of sync and, and in an office too long. And the Scott campaign and Scott himself also repeatedly used the word confused, saying Senator Nelson is confused. Uh, it was a tight race, a lot of money spent. The governor alone spent about $60 million of his own money. And the state's, of course, been flooded with TV campaign spots. Uh, this was also a big call by uh, Scott to Nelson during the race that, you know, he also hit this career politician, uh, kept going with that, saying three terms is enough, it's time to move on. And that's what Governor Scott says he actually uh, did graciously back to Senator Nelson was thanking him for all of his years of public service. Eric? Yes, yeah, Scott was uh, term limited as governor. Uh, what, what does this mean for the state, Phil? Uh, now that has two Republican senators, as we pointed out, in, in about a century. As we look forward to 2020, uh, that Florida really, in a, in a sense, has tipped more red. Yeah, Florida is a Republican state at this point all the way across the top in every statewide race until except for Nelson over the years there have been Republicans in every position the governor's mansion up in Tallahassee Republicans control both chambers of the set of the uh, Capitol up there in Tallahassee <gasps> Senator Nelson was the only Democrat on the statewide ticket that kept being reelected. Well, that is over. Now we'll have two U.S. senators from Florida, both Republican. We'll have a new governor in Florida, also Republican. And keep in mind, the state is very friendly to President Donald Trump. You can really say that it was Trump himself who swung the governor's race for Ron DeSantis, coming down and campaign with, campaigning with him two times in the last four days of the race. And there had been a longtime Republican uh, that was running for the governor's seat. That was Adam Putnam, the current commissioner of agriculture. Everybody in Florida on the inside thought for sure he is going to be the uh, heir apparent in that race. But DeSantis uh, trumped him in the primary. And uh, Tuesday night, DeSantis beat him again. Back to you. All right, we'll wait for the uh, concession speech, which we expect momentarily. We'll bring it to you a lot of course, when we get that film. Thank you so much. You know what, Eric, and while we wait, why don't we bring in John Bussey? He's on the phone. He's the associate editor for the Wall Street Journal and a Fox News contributor. So, you know, it was a long, long and hard uh, fought battle, a nail biter until the end. But uh, any surprises uh, to you, John, as for the outcome? Yeah, not a big surprise. Leading all along, the implication was that the recount would show that he would win. Uh, but look, this is a notable win for the Republicans. Uh, it's expected that they're also going to take the seat in Mississippi uh, after the after the, the, the runoff election uh, there. So they'll have a 53-47 majority in the Senate. That's up from 51-49. Not a bad showing, certainly, after getting walloped uh, in the House, where you really did see the blue wave uh, sweep through. This is going to make it easier for President Trump to get his judicial nominees through the Senate for confirmation. It'll make it easier for him to change out his cabinet, because if you remember, it's the Senate that has to confirm new cabinet members. Uh, and it will provide something of a little bit of momentum, a little bit of help going into 2020, though the, the results in the House, of course, will mitigate that. Definitely a notable uh, win for the Republican Party and for the president, who, as you know, is down there uh, you know, camp campaigning for Ron DeSantis, who is now the governor-elect of Florida, and uh, of course uh, now Senator Elect Rick Scott, and we're waiting to hear from Senator, uh, former Senator Bill Nelson. Uh, Rick Scott also got the backing of the president. So, <clears throat> pardon me, what do you think we're going to hear, John, from the president later tonight or in moments from now via Twitter or in a speech uh, or some sort of statement? Yeah, well, he'll want to claim victory. Um, you know, he kind of came out after the election and said it was a great night. When it... As I've always done, come together for the good of our state and our country. My focus will not be on looking backward, but on doing exactly what I ran on, making Washington work. So now the uh, governor of Florida heads to Washington, D.C., exchanging the statehouse 
for the Senate as the new senator-elect. We'll wrap this up with Phil Keating. Uh, Phil, it struck me that in uh, the current senator, Bill Nelson's statement, he referenced voter suppression. There have been allegations about that in, in, in Florida, perhaps insinuating that maybe he blames uh, what he calls voter suppression for uh, this defeat because it was uh, about 10,000 votes out of 8 million uh, passed. How do you see that shaking out? And what do you see uh, Nelson's well, legacy as? After, since Thursday, or actually really since Election Day, 18 days ago, the thrust of the legal challenges by Democratic Senator Nelson have pretty much circled around that whole voter suppression argument, suggesting that a lot of all of the votes weren't counted in a nutshell uh, around the state. But uh, he could have actually kept his legal challenges going, trying to earn a few more votes in this race. But as we have now seen and heard, Senator Nelson is giving it all up and conceding defeat to Republican Governor Rick Scott, who is finishing up his two terms as governor in Tallahassee. And after that, he will be heading to Washington, D.C. His whole theme of the campaign was let's get to work. And he vowed that career politicians need to go and he will get up there and do what he did for Florida, according to him. And that is get to work, create jobs, and keep taxes very low. Uh, here's how close Florida is. Remember, it's a toss-up, swing state. Both parties fight for this state bitterly for presidential years. This was also one of those campaigns and one of those election years because both parties really felt that whoever controls the governor's mansion as well in Tallahassee uh, would help them in the 2020 presidential elections. And here's what it came down to in the Senate race. 50.05% for, for Scott, 49.93 percent for Nelson out of 8 million votes cast. That is a margin of difference of 10,000 votes. Eric? And they say uh, every vote counts. This is certainly proof of that. Uh, a venerable Democratic senator has been retired by the people of his state in favor of a uh, upstart Republican, as you say, Senator Nelson has now uh, will be finishing his terms as Florida looks forward to 2020 and the Republican slate uh, when that comes, perhaps a change in politics for your state. Phil, thanks so much. And we are going to have much more on this very race. And now the new Senator Lech Rick Scott coming up at four o'clock Eastern. Please stick around for that. But in the meantime, uh, stay tuned right now as we uh, rejoin you to a uh, journal editorial report in progress. For the House, they gave it. They they wanted to send a message uh, to the to to the Trump White House uh, that they were dissatisfied. We saw this in the polling in Senate races. You had roughly, no matter what the number of people were that approved of the president, and it ranged from you know basically the high 40s in some states to the 60s in some of these red states that, that there were Senate elections this year. Just less than one third of the voters said, "I don't approve of him personally, but I approve of his policies." While two thirds of the people right. who approved of him said, "I approve of both." But you had, interestingly enough, about 10 percent of the electorate that said, I approve of his policies, but I don't approve of him personally, and I'm going to give him an unfavorable rating overall. And those were people primarily in the suburbs, particularly college-educated and particularly college-educated women. Okay. As you go ahead to look ahead to 2020, then how does the GOP and particularly President Trump get them back? Because he's got to reassemble that coalition that won in 2016 in states where he got really thumped, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Well, Ohio, they did Right, but Pennsylvania, Did Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, and he, he came close in 2016 in Minnesota, but this year was a wipeout. Yeah. Well, in Georgia, and Georgia is a defense, and North Carolina is going to be defense. Florida is going to be defense. They came relatively close in Colorado, but that's going to be a problem. So, look, we have two problems with suburban voters. Our old problem used to be that they were relatively socially moderate but economically conservative. They remain that way today, but in addition to navigating those shoals, you have to deal with the fact that they don't like the president's tone. They don't like how he handles things. They don't like how he tweets. They want a different tone in a president that is more optimistic and unifying than they're seeing right now. Okay, so if he that's that's a fixable problem if Trump is, is 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 willing to do it. All right, let's talk about Nancy Pelosi a bit before we go on. I mean, you you did a, an interesting column this week, kind of uh, adding up the number of Democrats who are now in Congress who said, "I'm not going to vote for," "I don't want to vote for," or uh, some, you have different gradations of that. Do you think she's going to win anyway? I think she will, but let's be clear about it. There are 234 Democrats. 
There are 26 Democrats who, during the campaign, said explicitly, I will not support her. Right. Uh, 11 of those were incumbents. Uh, the rest are freshmen. Uh, and that means that if, if all of them held true to their word, uh, she'd get 208 votes, 10 short of what she needs in order to be speaker. She'd still have the majority. There are only two going to be 201 Republicans. So she'd still have the majority. But if they voted for somebody else, she'd come up uh, short of the two, 218. Now, Theoretically, they could all vote present rather right. than voting for somebody, and that would lower the number of votes that you would need. In that case, it would lower it down to about 205, I think, or 206. But she's got to get 218, and the only way she can get there now is one of two ways. Either people break the, their word that they gave to the right. voters with the very first vote they cast in Congress, or they vote present, and it's going to be sort of hard to explain that one, too. Well, voting present, I mean, is a cop-out, let's face it. I, yeah. mean, it's, uh, you know, I said I vote against her, and then I said, oh, well, I chickened out in the end. That That'll, that can show up in an ad in 2020 as well as voting oh, oh, uh, for her. Absolutely. And look, we're likely to see that happen. Uh, we've already seen it happen in the Senate. Senator Kristen Sinema of Arizona said under the, in the campaign, under no circumstances will I support Chuck Schumer for, for Senate uh, Democratic leader. And yesterday he was elected Senate Democratic leader unanimously. <laughs> All right, uh, Carl. Well, politicians not keeping their word. What a surprise. Thank you. When we come back with polls showing that health care was the pivotal issue in the midterm elections, Democrats vow to make it a central part of their agenda heading in the 2020. So can Republicans change the health care narrative? Republican colleagues, for better, more comprehensive health care. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer Wednesday promising to make health care a central part of the Democratic agenda in the next two years as the party looks toward 2020. Polls show that health care was the top issue for voters in the midterm elections, with Democrats stoking fears that Republicans would end coverage of pre-existing conditions. We're back with Dan Henninger, Kim Strassel, and Kate Batchelder Odell. So, Kate, do you think, uh, you look at the, all the exit polling, you look at the races, did the failure of Republicans to repeal and replace Obamacare cost them the House? Yes, I think that's absolutely the conclusion you have to take because I think what happened, Paul, was there was a bit of a double bind in that uh, the base was unhappy that the party failed to repeal the law and right. more moderate and independent voters were unhappy that the party tried to repeal the law. So they took all of the political heat of having succeeded without having any of the uh, accomplishments or policy outcomes they could point to. They were in a double bind. I don't think it's like what the left says, which is that the law is just increasingly durable and popular. So if they had uh, actually done something and passed a, a repeal and replace, then they could have pointed to that and said, see, we've done something to address this issue, and here's how we would handle pre-existing conditions. When they, when they failed, what happened is that the, uh, the Democrats could say, see, they wanted to do this, and you're just uh, trying to prove a counterfactual. Right, exactly. It would have disapproved in the theory that people were going to be thrown off their insurance for having a pre-existing condition. I think also, Paul, we saw Republicans supporting a lawsuit on the constitutionality of some of Obamacare's mandates, including the pre-existing condition mandate. And while these are sort of interesting legal questions, it's not likely to prevail. And the members, the people supporting it, the candidates supporting it, took a, a huge political hit for having supported it. And it, it doesn't seem to have been worthwhile. It seems looks like a political loser. And that was Ken Paxton, the attorney general of Texas, who led that. And we criticized him for that, I recall. You probably wrote the editorial, Kate. But, uh, uh, and then he came back and said, oh, no, no, this is good. But it, it really did hurt them. It, it did. And look, it's just un unfortunately, uh, it's not going to convince John Roberts to strike down the Affordable Care Act. He already went through uh, so much struggle to find a way to uphold it, and I don't see this changing the outcome. And what Republicans really should be doing is spending this time in the wilderness thinking about how they're going to sell their ideas better if they get another shot at the repealing the law. Uh, Kim, Jason Lewis, who was uh, running in Minneapolis suburbs, a Republican incumbent, he lost his race, wrote for us this week that John McCain killing repeal and replace was the was the real uh, uh, in the Senate uh, was the real decisive vote. And of course, that got a lot of criticism. How can you criticize John McCain? But uh, what do you think of, uh, of that? No, there's something to that. Look, it's just the way it was. John McCain 
was very proud of that vote, and we should remember that he took it. Uh, he and Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, the Republicans, were on a knife's edge, uh, close enough to, to get this through. It would have given them, as Kate said, both the actual success of repealing it, but the ability to then go out and see some changes in the law that helped bring down prices um, and uh, where people could see what was actually happening. Uh, they didn't do it in the end. It was a, a huge failure on that part, given the campaign promise. And yeah, I mean, look, the House Republicans bore the brunt of, of the decision made by a handful of senators uh, on the other chamber. So, Dan, where do the Democrats, when Chuck Schumer says, uh, uh, or threatens, depending on your point of view, I'm going, we're going to make health care <laughs> our, uh, our, our focus, what are they going to do? Uh, threaten. Yeah, let's go with threaten. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, Obamacare, they passed that, and now basically they've, they, 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 it hurt yeah. them for several elections, and now they, they, they're now champions of it. The Democrats for the next year are going to be aiming at two targets. One, Donald Trump. The other, the pharmaceutical industry, big pharma. Elijah Cummings, who's becoming chairman of the House Oversight Committee, which is a tremendously powerful committee, is probably going to spend about 70% of his time tormenting the Trump administration, but he says he intends to investigate the pharmaceutical industry. And he's going to issue subpoenas, he's going to ask, you, ask questions about drug prices, and the goal is going to be to kind of use that as a cat's paw to get them to compromise on some sort of deal that regulates drug prices prices in the United States. And the problem is that the president of the United States himself seems to be willing to do that. He has talked about associating Medicare Part B prescription prices to those in developed countries over in Europe. So Big Pharma has really got its work cut out for him defending its innovation. Yeah, I think, Kate, uh, that's a possibility for Trump. He might go for that. And then also, what about Medicare for all? Is that something that Democrats are going to push? Or are they going to, in the House and Senate, or are they going to leave that to uh, the presidential candidates? You know, Paul, I think they're going to be relatively quiet about that over the next couple years because I think it's really unpopular with the public when you start to talk about, uh, you know, eliminating employer-sponsored insurance, right? I mean, the Bernie Medicare for All bill was not written to become law. It was written as sort of a um, eccentric policy proposal. And so I don't think it's, it's helpful to Democratic House candidates uh, to hold it up as what they're really about. I think that, uh, Dan's right, they're really going to coalesce more on the pharmaceutical uh, price controls idea because it's something that they think Trump can be amenable to. And maybe talk about things like a public option um, for insurance uh, and wait for Medicare for all to really litigate that in the presidential debates in 2020. Okay, thanks, Kate. Still ahead, Amazon's announcement of its new headquarters in New York and Virginia, drawing backlash as taxpayers and local officials find out just how much two new headquarters in the D.C. suburbs of Arlington, Virginia, and the borough of Queens in New York City. But outrage is growing as details of the deal emerge, with New York State alone offering more than a billion and a half dollars in tax breaks and incentives to the retail giant in return for bringing a promised 25,000 jobs to its new campus. Mayor Bill de Blasio called it a great day for New York City, but even newly elected Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a Democratic Socialist, called the taxpayer subsidies extremely concerning. We're back with Dan Henninger, Wall Street Journal columnist Bill McGurn, and editorial board member Alicia Finley. So, Bill, my favorite part of this is the helipad that they get at the, at the new campus. Uh, right. I guess uh, that will not be available to everyone. Right. right <laughs> but right, is right. this a good deal for New York and Virginia? No, it's not. It's, um, uh, it shows that the real threat to the economic order isn't socialism, it's corporatism. Like, call us old fashioned, but if you're going to have welfare, it should be for the poor, <laughs> not for the world's richest man. And that seems to be uniting people. I mean, uh, Governor Cuomo's defense of this deal was extraordinary. In the New York Times, he basically said, since our tax rates are such a disincentive, anyone in his right mind, just judging by the merits, would go to Texas. Therefore, I had to cough up a lot of stuff to get Amazon to come here to give them privileges and favors that other people don't get. But who's responsible for those tax rates? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, right. He could change those. Right. But he if he but that's, well, that's hard. Look, that's the difference. They're all betting you you put you jack your rates that you have a business unfriendly environment in the state. Right. And then you play favorites and you try to get someone to bail you out like this. Look, it's not the first time Governor Cuomo had that Buffalo billion ended in corruption. None of the jobs produced that it promised. That was a subsidy program for business in upstate, in upstate New, York. New York. And, you know, um, 
ended in corruption and failure. I don't think failure. it's ended, it's continued. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so Alicia, from Amazon's point of view, though, uh, even though all that's true about Jeff Bezos, it's hard to blame him, I guess, it seems to me, if the politicians are willing to shower him with, with money. <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's a pragmatic businessman, and if they're saying, here, you can have all this, then uh, if, uh, why not take it? Right. I mean, Elon Musk did the same thing with Nevada and a, a battery factory. If they're going to give him a couple billion dollars, why not? And Scott Walker for Scott Fox Walker, Con Fox in Wisconsin. Con, and now he's uh, suggesting uh, another package for Kimberly Clark to help uh, rescue jobs there. This is bipartisan on both sides. Uh, but really, the politicians should be responsible and be more responsible stewards of taxpayer dollars. But 260 some jurisdictions tried to get. Amazon. So this is. And Amazon actually turned down something like Maryland with that in Newark, which offered even bigger subsidies, which suggests maybe it would have gone to New York and DC anyways. Because why? Because it has more intellectual capital. It has talent. A, a talent, right? Tech talent. I mean, finance, banks, and hedge funds are really recruiting uh, engineers. Amazon will be able to poach some of those. The figure, Dan, that I like. Another one is that uh, Google. Uh, it has a big presence in New York uh, uh, no. as well. I think they have something like 10,000 jobs here. Uh, they're not getting a package of a billion and a half dollars. And I think Alicia's point is a salient one. They might have done gone here anywhere, anyway, New York anyway, because of the other things it offers. Yeah, they might have. I mean, one of the things they, Amazon says is they need a heavy core, a critical mass of technical, technological workers, and they feel New York, Northern Virginia is going to be able to provide that. The city of Columbus said we admit we don't have enough techno technical workers to supply Amazon with 25,000 people. All that aside, to me, the most fascinating thing going on here is that this is, deal was done by Mayor Bill de Blasio and Governor Andrew Cuomo, both typical probable candidates for the Democratic nomination, they are getting hammered, hammered by <laughs> fellow Democrats right. who are just dumping on them for giving away this $2 billion. I think what's going on here is that Ocasio-Cortez, the head of the city council, are upset that this money has gone to Amazon and not to their pet right. projects. So it's not as though they're upset about corporate right. welfare. It's just that the it's money's a, all gone now. It's the wrong corporate it's welfare. Wrong corporate <laughs> right. Exactly. It's polit Look, that's what happens when you politicize decisions. One of the really bad aspects of this was that um, a lot of the cities didn't say what they were offering. You know, they're going to spend the taxpayers' money, but it was secret. Some disclosed, some didn't. But I think Amazon insisted on a non-disclosure clause for the last 20, the finalists. So pe this really was the case. We had to agree to it to find out what was in it. And that's, I think that's why people are also just sprung on them this way. Is there any chance that this could be uh, undone uh, in either New York State or New York City or perhaps uh, Virginia? I, th I, th I think it'd be hard to undo it. Um, uh, I think it'll be very hard. Some some of the incentives already exist. It's just that they're applying it to Amazon, right? Oh, right. Some of the things exist. Some uh, of them, but some of them are also but it is, special. You know, I think the Wall Street Journal's position is right. We we don't want bodega owners and guys that work at a laundromat to have to subsidize billionaires, right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> Still ahead, plunging oil prices, Britain's messy divorce from the EU. We'll take a closer look at what's driving the sluggish world economy. This as the British pound dropped sharply Thursday after Prime Minister Theresa May's draft divorce deal with the European Union was thrown into doubt. We're back with Dan Henninger, Alicia Finley and Bill McGurn. So, Dan, how worried should we be about uh, the world economy uh, right now? Well, I think there's a lot of reason to be concerned, Paul, because uh, the United States, on the one hand, seems to be booming. We're at full employment. Uh, all the signs of consumer confidence are tremendously strong. But if you look out around the world, this picture isn't so bright. Germany's economy contracted in the last quarter. Europe itself seems to be slowing down. You just described what's going on uh, in the UK with Brexit. Japan's economy slowed also in the last quarter, and China's growth rate is now about 6.5 percent, which is really kind of low for them. So you get the sense that there is a lot suppressing the global economy out there. The dollar's very strong, but it's kind of delinking from some of these other currencies, and usually when that happens, bad things 
things happen. What's uh, behind it, uh, Bill? I think you've got some bad policy choices right. in, uh, in political turmoil in, in, the, in, in Europe, for example. Right. But um, rising interest rates also right. here in the U.S., right. uh, which is drawing capital and from I the rest that, of the world. That, that hurts the president. He's been so critical of the Fed chairman. And he, he actually has some points, but it makes it harder for the Fed chairman to do the right thing without looking like he's a lackey of the president. Maybe right. pausing what they Pause, yeah, you think I will think be the interest the right rate path. increase I think it's the right idea, but the timing is is everything. Look, I think the United States is fundamentally sound. I mean, I, I reject the idea that we're on a sugar high. I think yes. that the corporate tax cuts really change the structure and the incentives for investment. But look, I live in the suburbs. When you buy a house, you want a nice community. Like, it's no good to just have a really nice house to yourself, right? right? You depend on the community and the downtown to be prosperous too. And we don't live in a zero sum world. These people are our customers. If their economies, the two other big economies, Japan and Germany are contracting. You know, there's less that they can buy of our stuff, and uh, yeah, it's a difference, uh, Alicia, between maybe having three and three and a half percent growth continuing here, and we're going back down to the slows of two, two and a half percent, which Donald Trump promised he'd get us out of. I think that's right. I mean, during the third quarter, you did see a drop in business investment down to about 0.8 percent. Um, if you consumer spending has been pretty buoyant. But if you want to maintain 4% uh, growth or above 3%, you're going to have to uh, maintain a higher level of business investment. And that is going to require uh, uh, buoyant foreign global markets. And the trade uh, uh, piece of this, Dan, I don't think you can underestimate. If you the, the, the third quarter figure that Alicia mentioned included that investment figure, I think that was partly trade related. You know, you have one thing we criticized Barack Obama for was all the regulation, which called caused something of a capital strike. His businesses said, hey, I don't know who's going to hit me next year, so I'm not going to make that investment. Trade is, uh, operates in a similar way. It's gov arbitrary government that can hit people with tariffs or new rules to change their supply chains. If that happens, they may say if that you fear that hap might happen, then you say, well, I'm going to hold off on investment. Yeah. Well, Donald Trump, President Trump argues that there are, we want to open the Chinese market and there are certain disparities in our trading relationships with all of these other countries that justify these tariffs that he has imposed. Be that as it may, the negotiations, especially with China, uh, are going nowhere. And so the tariff regime that he's imposed on China is beginning to look chronic. That's a long-term problem because you've got all these complicated global supply chains. Companies have to make decisions based on whether they're going to make money in the context of these tariffs. I think probably the best thing the president could do right now, given what we've just described, is pull back to a great degree on the, the tariff war that he's undertaken and ensure that the global economy doesn't slow down because if it does, it's going to be hurting him possibly in 2020 when he's running for re-election. Uh, Dan, uh, I mean, Bill, last question. Wilbur Ross, one of the trade hawks right. in the administration, right. Commerce Secretary, said, well, we're going to have a trade framework with President right. Xi of China in the G20 later in November. I, I think we need something positive now. I mean, look, that's the, the danger. You mentioned supply chains. I think a lot of people just think trade is things for things, but a lot of the pricing of your own goods and stuff comes from a very complicated network. And when you put tariffs on, you just blow the whole thing up. So I think the pressure right now is on. Look, the bad news was Peter Navarro, one of the the hawks, right, was out there warning Wall Street, don't pressure us on China. And then Larry Kudlow, of course, warned Peter Navarro, say don't pressure, uh, don't pressure them on this. A sign of the debate internally right. in the White House. When we come back as California continues to battle its devastation.